Thank you, Brother Tim, and his availability there in the back. I know he's normally on the sound there, so he's got a little new experience in there, uh, stepping in there tonight, so I appreciate him uh, kind of covering both sides there tonight for, uh, for the sound. Let me get All right, you should be on there, Tim. All right, if you got your Bibles, go back to the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter number three. Malachi chapter number three. And uh, I've taken a couple times here on some opportunities to fill in uh, with Pastor out of town or just times he's asked me to, to kind of speak. And um, just want to share some thoughts from, honestly, just from one of my classes I've had uh, here in my seminary studies on the book of Malachi. And um, it's one of those, and it was kind of a surprise for me as I uh, took the class and got to dig into the book a little bit to see just how practical of a book Malachi is. And this is a very pivotal book going from uh, around the 4th, 5th century B.C. before, uh, before the uh, physical uh, appearance of Christ on earth when he uh, came and lived the 33 and a half years, died on the cross, buried, rose again, and is in heaven today. Uh, but this is uh, right before what we would call the 400 silent years uh, where there were no prophecies, there was no writing. And what uh, we may call the uneventful waiting period that was going on at this time. And Malachi kind of sums things up of, of judgment, uh, speaking to the priests, to the leadership, and that's where his attention is in parts here in the book. But the main thrust of this book of Malachi is this idea of overcoming apathy. And if there's one thing, I think if you ask any church member or any preacher, uh, one thing that can destroy relationships, that can destroy a church, is that of apathy. We know there's so many things that can destroy a church, but as I've, I've always heard it put, and I stand by it every time I hear or see something like this, I can do a whole lot more, and I've learned this in youth ministry, and now going to the chaplaincy, and with two little ones at home in school, I can do a whole lot more. I think all parents and teachers can attest to this, that I can do a whole lot more with I don't know than I don't care. I don't know. If you don't know something, we got books, we got practical experience, we can teach you. If you know how to play the piano, Ms. Danny Craig offers lessons you can go to every week. If you don't know, if you want to learn more about this book, there's an opportunity Thursday nights that you can go and learn more about this book. And uh, we, there, there's a lot we can do with I don't know. There's lots of opportunities to learn and to apply, hopefully, what we hear and what we learn. But when it comes to I don't care, there's nothing that you can say, no amount of teaching, nothing that can change a heart, apart from the Holy Spirit himself. And that's exactly what Malachi is trying to deal with here in this book, is awakening God's people out of their spiritual slumber. And so the, the, the title for the class I took was Overcoming Apathy in Ministry. Now, again, I'm not just speaking to pastors or to people in full-time ministry or those who may be serving in the ministries here, but just for, for, for Christians in general. What are some good, practical things that can awaken us from our spiritual slumber? You know, it's so easy in life that we can get bogged down with the things of this life. We can get bogged down by pandemics, by masks, by vaccinated or not vaccinated, by who's in the White House and, and who's controlling the House and the Senate and... Uh, all those different things. Or for us in, in our world, when will the baseball lock out and right? We can get all caught up in all kinds of things that don't mean much in eternity. That we lose sight of what's most important. And that's the purpose of the local church. Not just Bible Baptist Temple, but the local church. And so what are some things that we can do in our lives? Some things that we can uh, apply. Some things that we can do. Some things that we can become that can help us in regard to this topic of apathy. Apathy is something that can take over without us even realizing it. We can become desensitized to sin, whether through television, whether through the meet other outlet, media outlets, whether through social media. We can become so desensitized that we just don't care. And it's, and it's sad that we hear people say, well, what's so wrong about that lifestyle? What's so wrong about this? We've just lost our passion. I'm not saying we go and look for a fight and condemn anyone who lives different than we believe they, that the Bible says they should live, right? That's the Holy Spirit's job, but not, not to back down either. May we stand firm on our convictions. And, I, and to be honest, going into this chaplain realm, this is a whole new, whole new field for me. You know, I've been serving here and here at Bible Baptist Temple now going on eight years, and I've been in ministry now for almost 11 years, and 
know, this is new territory. Uh, just in my internship, lots of backgrounds, lots of different religious beliefs, lots of different lifestyles. And you know what? I can, if I'm not careful, lose who I am in the midst of the otherness, as, as they call it sometimes. There's a lot of otherness out there, even under the calling of chaplain or minister. Chaplain would be a minister of the gospel. And so it's important that we overcome this, this attitude, this feeling of apathy. Is it worth it? Is it truly worth it? Let's be honest. Is it worth it? Is the fight worth it? All right, the Bible says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. This world's not getting any better. It's only getting worse and worse. So are we going to let our light shine brighter, or are we just going to fade off and let the devil blow that light out, right? The little kid song we sing, right? Let our light shine, not let Satan blow out our candle. And so tonight, just want to continue this study, and I think it's been a few months ago last time that I shared some thoughts and some truth here from Malachi, uh, from the book of Malachi. We looked at the first part of Malachi chapter 3. And uh, one of these topics that, that, I, that I brought forth was about remember God's refining in our lives. Right? We, we think of the psalm, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Right? We're not, we're, uh, think about it, we're not what we were, hopefully, at the moment of salvation. But we're also not what God, I think, would ultimately have us to be. I think we're all honest. None of us are, have arrived, you might say, or where we would desire to become one day. So Paul said in Philippians 3, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, not looking, not looking back, but looking forward, thanking God for the victories of the past. And you know, it's important we thank God for victories in our lives, where we've come from. And if we all stood, we all, there'd be some wonderful testimonies, I'm sure, if we gave opportunities here tonight of some wonderful victories that God has given us in our lives. But as important as those are, may those be a foundation for us to continue looking ahead continue looking forward. And part of that, as painful as it is, is what we might call God's spiritual spankings or God's spiritual corrections in our lives. Again, Hebrews 11 talks much about the fact that God's goal isn't to just harm us, to hurt us. Yes, it may hurt in the moment, just as any loving parent has to discipline that child for that wrong behavior. And, and it's one of those, until I became a parent, I didn't fully understand when my parents will say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Well, switch places. I, in my mind, I didn't say it. I wasn't dumb enough to say it, but I said, let's switch places and see. <laughs> no. But it's so true. It's not going to hurt physically, right, as a parent, but it hurts our heart. It hurts our emotion. The fact that we have to bring harm to our child to help them be the young man or the young lady that God would have them to be. And that's exactly what, what God's doing here in this book of Malachi through the prophet. And so we looked at that in the first part of chapter 3, but go ahead and look now to verse number 8. And yes, we are going to talk about giving tonight. Now again, I'm going to say some things that may sound a little controversial a little bit, but hear me out, okay? Uh, well, we have some scriptural background here, so uh, we're going to read through the, read, we'll just read the first couple of verses here. So we'll read verse 8 through verse 11, and then, or verse 12, excuse me, and then uh, we're hopefully trying to get through Two, there's two more of these, what we may call, what I've entitled, antidotes for apathy. So that's kind of the whole study here of, this, of these thoughts. It's antidotes for apathy. So hopefully, Lord willing, if we, uh, time allows, get through these last two to go through the end of chapter 3. But verse number 8, the Bible states, Will a man rob God? Question. Yet ye have robbed me. So God answers his own question. He says, yes, you, my people, have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? And the Lord answers, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. If you look back in verse number 8, that word rob carries the idea of to take forcibly. Right? When someone enters a home that's uninvited, 
they're going to take something that's not theirs. And so how is this happening? What, what's going on here that God is saying? Obviously, we know as believers that everything we have belongs to God. Our, uh, the cars we drive, the, the homes we have, and the money in our pockets. As much or as little as that may be, right? But everything we have is given us by God. And I've always heard the, seen the example of uh, if I were to go to Brother Melvin, I had, took my wallet out and I gave it to Brother Melvin. I said, Brother Melvin, can you look after this for me and I'll be back to get it here in just a little bit. Am I giving that to Brother Melvin? No, of course not. I'm entrusting him to take care of what's my property until I come back and say, hey, brother, can I, can I have that back? And he gives it back. That's the same idea that what we have, God, in a sense, has come to us and said, Brother Melvin, take care of this for me. Brother Dennis, take care of this for me. Brother Brad, take care of this for me. And that's the idea that they have robbed God. And I thought my professor was a little bold when he said this. He says, we can be guilty of embezzling God's money for our own selfish gains and satisfaction. Now, don't get me wrong. It, it, if, if we use our money for something that's not spiritual, does it mean it's always wrong? No, not, of course not. Right? We need to have food to eat. That's not spiritual, right? There's nothing spiritual about eating food, right? Taking care of ourselves, certainly. But we have to take care of ourselves. And God understands that. But it's about the heart. That's where it starts. God knew the heart of his people, and that is what he's going after. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Everything flows from the heart. Paul writes about eternal investment in Colossians 3, verse 2, and he states, Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. So when we give back to God what belongs to him in the first place, I think that'll go a long ways toward curing apathy in our lives. And we realize, God, this belongs to you, and here it is. We give back to God what belongs to him. Look at Hannah. She asked for a child, and she said, God, if you'll give me a, a, man, a son, I will give him back to you. God did his part, and I'm sure after some tears and difficult days, she said, God, here he is. And if you read the rest of the story in Hannah's life in 1 Samuel, the Bible says that she eventually had, I think it was three sons and two daughters, or maybe two sons and three daughters, but it was, I think, five children after Samuel. But if you know the story, she was barren. She couldn't have children. And yet she eventually had six children because she made a promise, a vow to God, kept that vow, and God honored her for following what she promised to God. This following illustration may shed some lights on this topic of giving here on this top on this cure for apathy. It says, on the Sunday that a church was supposed to make their giving commitments, the organist fell sick, so a substitute was brought in. The pastor gave her a scheduled service and asked her to think of something to play during the commitment time. So kind of a, a public offering time this church had. So when people would give offering, either passing the plates, which yes, that was that's what's done here recently, right? Uh, something that's kind of in our uh, recent past that we have the, the box in the back. But during this collection time, he asked her, hey, find, figure something to play that would be lively for that moment. At the scheduled time in the service, the pastor said, and I quote, I want anyone who's committing $1,000 to the building fund to stand up. So he said, if you're going to give $1,000 to our building fund, stand up now. The organist, upon hearing this, immediately began playing the Star Spangled Banner. And that is how the substitute organist became the regular organist. That's a little humorous there. So, a pretty good giving that day, apparently. Now, I'm going to make a statement here that may be controversial, but hear me out. And I've got some back, back up here, I think, to go through this. When it comes to giving, I believe from Scripture and from this study that we are not under the tithing giving. You might say, Brother Jason, we give the tithe every single week, the 10%, that goes to the Lord, right? Yes. But based on Scripture, that was given to the Old Testament Jewish believers. Let me, let me show you here. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And I was just like you when I heard that the first time. I said, that doesn't make sense. That can't be right. But 1 Corinthians chapter 16 Go to, just start verse 1, verses 1 and 2. The Bible states, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. 
So now, in particular, this is speaking about the collection uh, for the saints. And they were, they would take, Paul, at this time, was taking up a collection for the poor saints and believers in Jerusalem. And so they were taking a collection, and he would go to these churches that he planned, and he said, all right, guys, what do you want to, what, what can you give to the church in Jerusalem? And so they would take the collection, go to the next place, take the collection, and take that gift back to Jerusalem. So he's referring to that here specifically. But he says here, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So let me propose to you that we are under a system of giving that is both systematic and proportionate. Systematic and proportionate giving. What do I mean by that? Give as God has prospered us. I think of the story in the Gospels where the poor widow, if you remember the story, who, the Bible says all these rich men that gave large sums of money. We don't know what that may have been. Maybe $1,000, maybe a million dollars, maybe $10,000. <clears> gave large sums of money. But the Bible says this widow threw in two mites. We're talking, you know, 10 cents or so in the offering plate. And notice that God praised her. Why? Because she gave of what she, of everything she had. She gave systematically and proportionately. She gave all that she had and God praised her for that sacrifice. But we give systematically, right? Some, may, some of you may give on Sundays. Some may give on Wednesdays. For me, I usually give on Sundays. A systematic time and a proportionate amount according to what God has blessed us with. My systematic proportionate giving may be a little different than Brother Ball's systematic proportionate giving. And his proportionate giving will be a little different than Brother George's. And his will be a little different than Brother Herndon's and so on and so forth. Here's the thing. It's not about the amount on the check or the amount in the envelope as it is the obedience and the heart of the believer giving that money. That's what it comes down to. Now, let me say this. Many of us may adopt the tithe as our way of systematic, proportionate giving. You know what? That's okay. Whatever works for you, whatever you believe God would have you to do, if you've prayed about it and God gives you that peace that that's what you should do, then you do it. But we're not under what we might call the tithe system of giving. We're under what we might say more of a proportionate, systematic source of giving. We see that in the Old Testament, uh, about tithing. It's mentioned in Genesis chapter 14 that Abraham gave tithes of all he had to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, we believe, is kind of a, uh, kind of a type of Christ, king of Salem or king of peace as he's known. Then Genesis chapter 28, um, as Jacob is uh, fleeing after stealing his brother's birthright, he promises to give a tithe uh, of the tenth of everything he has. But here, here's one thing that's interesting to know. First of all, uh, go back to Malachi chapter 3 before I get off course too much here. Malachi chapter 3 again. We see, first of all, the problem that's stated. Ye have robbed me in the tithes and the offerings. May we not be of the number of those who rob and embezzle God's money. May we realize that all we have, money or otherwise, belongs to God. So now the problem is solved. How's the problem solved? Look at verse number 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. Notice a couple of things. First of all, notice the word all, all the tithes into the storehouse. God says, whatever you're going to give, bring it all. Don't hold back. Give what God would have you to give. There was a place that they, that they set aside specifically for the offerings. Uh, many believe that specifically the context refers to some kind of a food or grain offering. The, the Jews were to tithe of the best of their crops and their possessions. Now we're going to, I'm going to take you through a, a, a really quick, I promise, a really quick study here of the Jewish system of giving. Now today, many of us give the, the tenth, 10% 10 back to the Lord. Now in Jewish times, their system of tithing was a little bit different. They didn't give just one 10% tithe and that was that. So if you take your Bibles, I'm going to take you to a couple of quick places here. Go, um, go to the book of, make sure here, go to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 27. Yes, we're going to go to Leviticus here tonight, Leviticus chapter 27. And I'm going to show you briefly three different types of tithes that the Jews would give and give you some 
perspective on the importance of Malachi chapter 3 to the Jewish to the Jews during this time. Here's some of the laws of tithing under under Moses. So Leviticus chapter 27, notice here's the first tithe, verse number 30. It says, "In all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord." Right off the bat, that first we might call that 10% tithe of the produce that fed the Levites. Uh, the tithe of the land. And so uh, one of the ways that the Levites, if you know, if you remember in Scripture when they divided up the land, divided up the property and divided things to the, the tribes of Israel, you notice Levi didn't get anything. He didn't get any property. And you say, well, wow, God left them out in the cold. No, he had a plan to take care of them, and this was how he did it. They took a tithe from the other tribes to help feed the Levites. See, God has a wonderful plan to take care of us. It may not always make sense, but trust God's hand. Trust his hand and trust his heart. And this was how he took care of the Levites, was through the giving of the other tribes. Then go ahead to Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy 14, so that was the first tithe that, that the children of Israel gave, and that was to help take care of Levi and take care of the priests because the tribe of Levi was was the, the priest uh, of, of the nation of Israel. Then go to uh, Deuteronomy 14 and verse 22. Verse 22. I'm sorry, I'm in numbers. <laughs> Here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy 14, verse 22. The Bible states, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. This was a tithe eaten by the laity during a special service. And so these were different types of tithes that God commanded of the, the nation of Israel. So another 10%. Then look Further down in the chapter, verse 28, verse 28, verse, same chapter, Deuteronomy 14, we see a third tithe <clears throat> that God commands of the Israelites. And this one's not as a regular of a tithe as the other ones. Notice it says in verse 28, At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe thy increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thy hand, which thou doest. So a third tithe taking place every, as you notice, every three years. They didn't give this tithe on a regular weekly, monthly, yearly basis. This was every third year to help foreigners, widows, and orphans. God was looking out for others. And, and if you do the numbers here, and my instructor went through some of these numbers, that first tithe was approximately about a 10% tithe. So I left the Jews then, take that 10% off, 90%. Then the next tithe was a 10% on that. So 10% of 90 would be 9%. That would drop them to 81%. And then this third tithe, if you divide it yearly, would be about two and a half to three percent from that nine percent. It's about another three percent. So you're doing yearly for the Jews, they would, instead of the 90 percent, they would take home 78-ish percent. So when God is talking about tithes and offerings, this was a significant part. This was almost a quarter of all that they brought in. God asked of them to give back. That's just the tithe. That's not even the offerings that were above the tithe. So this was a very significant point that Malachi brings up here. So if you go back to Malachi chapter 3, this isn't just, oh, a simple tithe. This was significant for the Israelites here. The Jews were well aware of the great sacrifice they were called upon to make, but they also realized that God was worthy of all or anything he asked of them. How, how worthy is God to us? Is he worth what he asks of us? 
God calls to do something, is he worthy of us to obey that? How much is God worth to us? And that's what worship is all about. Worship is giving value, giving worth. God, this is, how, this is what you mean to me. Not, and worship isn't just about a song we sing. It's the way we live our lives. Living our lives in a way that shows just how much God means to us. And that's what God was testing his people with. The Lord has established the local church as the gathering place for our giving here in the church age. And notice the giving of God's people in the church of Macedonia. For sake of time, I'll just read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Bible states, verse 1 and 2, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Notice, affliction, joy, poverty resulted in liberal giving. They didn't look at the problems they were dealing with, right? The Roman persecutions were fierce at this time. They didn't look at the poverty that they were under. They had joy, and that joy from their heart resulted in liberal, generous giving. So we see that the, uh, that the problem, we see the problem how it is solved to bring me all the tithes into the storehouse. Go back to verse 10 in Malachi chapter 3. And we see now the prosperity that's seen. The prosperity that's seen. Verse 10. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open, the window, open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. And I like this statement that my instructor made. He said, we cannot, we cannot afford not to give. We want God's blessing in our lives? Obey his commands. Follow his rules. Do what God has asked of us. God says, are you willing to give? Are you going to honor me with your best? That was part of what got the priests in trouble in the beginning of the book of Malachi. They were taking the weak, sickly animals and saying, here, God, here's our best, when in reality... They were giving God the worst, the leftovers. God, who knows all things, knew their heart, knew that their heart was not right with him, knew that apathy had crept in and was controlling the way they operated the priesthood. And so God is getting after this idea of honoring him. So we see some blessings that come. First, in, in verse 10, we see abundant blessings. We can never certainly outgive God, ever. Whatever God gives, he'll give us back more. I think of this familiar story that puts the heart of this verse quite well. The story, I quote, The story is told of a good farmer who loved the Lord and believed in stewardship. He was generous indeed and was asked by his friends why he gave so much and yet remained so prosperous. We can't understand you, his friends said. Why you seem to give more than the rest of us and yet you always seem to have greater prosperity. Oh, said the farmer, that is easy to explain. You see, I keep shoveling into God's bin, and God keeps shoveling more and more into mine, and God has the bigger shovel. That's just how the Christian life works. We shovel, God shovels. We have the little tiny shovel, and God's got the big old massive shovel going our way. Now, again, I'm not trying to preach a health and wealth gospel, the prosperity gospel, right? Give a thousand dollars, and there'll be a ten thousand in your account tomorrow. I'm not, not naive to think like that, okay? Now, if you feel led to give whatever, you do what God leads you to do. But I would be foolish to tell you what some of those preachers are going to have to give account of one day that have duped and deceived God's people. And we know that giving isn't going to the church, it's going to themselves. But may we just obey and do what God has us to do. And we can never outgive God. And there's abundant blessings. Pour you, pour, open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There shall not be room enough to receive it. I, I like the picture there. God's just saying, I'm just going to open up and just pour you out something. To God, it probably doesn't seem like much, but for us, it's 
overwhelming of what God wants to bless us with and bless each of us and bless this church and bless your families with. Or are we willing to trust God and to do what he wants us to do? So we see abundant blessings. We see next tangible blessings. Go to verse 11. Tangible blessings. When it talks about the devourer, there's a couple of possibilities. One possibly is some of the invading nations that were talked about that God brought judgments on in the earlier prophets. But I believe, from what I've seen, I believe more of this other idea, and that is of the pestilence. And it's fitting that we're talking about pestilence with COVID-19 pandemics and pestilence that we're facing right now in our, in our, in our world. De but rebuke the devourer for your stakes, sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. God says there'll be blessing, there'll be protection. When you honor God, God will bless in great and mighty ways that we just cannot understand. And then finally, we see spiritual blessings in verse 12. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. And I like how this is put. God wants to literally turn the nation of Israel into a literal tourist attraction for all nations. And again, I say that with utmost respect. God wants to make us a spectacle of his blessing, of his power, if we let him, to the world that's around us, that's looking for answers that's lost and dying and going to hell. But again, it's not about how much you give, it's about the heart behind what you give. And again, our systematic, proportionate giving is all going to be a little bit different. Now, if you use the tithe, I'm not saying that's wrong and to throw away what you've been doing in regard to your giving. That's a systematic, proportionate way of giving. That's what God leads you to do. Do it. But whatever God has called you to do, do it. I've, I've heard of stories of preachers who flipped it around and gave the 90% and kept the 10%. That's some faith. Absolutely. To take that 90% knowing, I don't know how I'm going to pay the mortgage, I don't know how I'm going to pay for this or pay the electric bill, whatever. I'm just going to give what God calls me to do. And amazingly, everything's taken care of. And as David said in, in the book of Psalms, I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. When we do what God wants us to do, take care of us. We may not be rolling in luxury, right? making the big six, seven figures, or whatever that may be, right? Or, or catching that American dream. But you know what? We're taken care of. What did Paul say? Having food and raiment, let us be content. Paul didn't even say I had to have a house to live in or a roof over my head. He said, just having food, something to eat, and clothes on my back, I'm good. I'm content. Are we willing to trust God in our giving? And then real quick, and we are just about out of time, but go to verse 13. And I want to just share this one briefly. This one's very brief. Remember God's preeminence in our lives. Our giving is a reflection of God's value in our lives. If God is truly preeminent in our lives, it's going to reflect in the way we give and reflect in the way we not just give of our money, but give of ourselves. There's opportunities galore here, right here at Bible Baptist Temple to serve, to minister. Giving of yourselves. If Christ is important as, as, as we say he is in our lives, give him preeminence and say, God, what do you want me to do? And God may say, hey, why don't you, why don't you take a Sunday and wash those babies in the nursery so some parents can hear the gospel and be saved and trust Christ. It all goes hand in hand. Uh, or uh, maybe might mean coming in and clean the, the sanctuary for church. And I appreciate people who come behind and take care of the little things that if those things aren't done, it's seen right away. If the little things aren't done, it's noticed. And so just doing what God wants to do, keeping God preeminent in our lives, keeping him first place in our lives. So I'll leave off with there for tonight. I know, sake of time, we're about out of time here tonight. But if you look at the end of chapter 3, just to summarize it briefly, we see first the ungodly and their repulsion of, uh, uh, and the questions that they give says, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his words? They're saying, God, what point is there in serving you? It's vain. We're not getting anything out of it. And, and look at the ungodly that are prospering. 
Where is the God of judgment? And then it says, and now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. So that's, the, that's the, the complaint, the concern that's brought up. And then, as the chapter wraps up, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So we see that many of these people repented for those attitudes. And if you notice, it's a change of heart. The ungodly lived in that mindset. There's no point serving the Lord. We're done. God, those ungodly people being blessed, I want to be blessed. But they that feared the Lord, the Bible says, repented, changed their minds, and encouraged one another, spake one to another. That's one reason we're here, is to encourage one another, to build each other up. Guess what God did in my life this week? How else are you going to do it besides right here in God's house? The opportunity is to share what God is doing in our lives, and it's an encouragement to us. Just keep on keeping on being faithful. The book of remembrance, I believe, refers to the book of life. And there's discussions about whether our names are already in the book and our names can be blotted out or can our names be written. And I believe from Scripture that our names are in the book of life. And when we reject Christ, they can be blotted out. There's much evidence for that. And I like how, it, um, how my instructor put it this way. If I can find it here in my notes. He says, in this passage, when we trust Christ as Savior... Our names go from being penciled in, if we reject Christ, right? You can erase that with the pencil, right? From being penciled in to being inked in at salvation. I like that thought. Before we trust Christ, our names are in that book. They can be taken out, if, erased if we reject Christ. It can be erased from the Ryan's book of life. But upon salvation, that name is inked in for all of eternity. Melvin Wilcox, inked in, never going to change, never going to be removed. And unlike our founding documents that are in Washington, D.C., that are slowly fading over time, lasted well for a quarter of a century, but given enough time, that ink's going to eventually completely fade away. That name is going to be inked in the Lamb's Book of Life for all of eternity. And then God says, we're his jewels. Verse 17, they shall be mine in the day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own, his own son that serveth him. Then verse 18, Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So we see the repulsion by ungodly men and then finally the respect shown by the true believers. So where are we at? Where are you at? Are we questioning God's direction? Just like Asaph faced in, in Psalm 73, I believe Pastor preached on that passage a while back, when Asaph said, God, you're good and I trust you, but why are all these wicked people doing so well and why am I struggling? And what happens in that passage? God takes him to, to, the, to the church house, to the synagogue, and in the Lord's house, God shows him, he says, it's not going to be like this for forever, Asaph. It's going to change. This is all that they have right now. Right? We see in our society, on TV, uh, the, the people that are being paraded or being applauded, that are being honored, literally worshipped by many, standing completely diabolically opposed to this book. You know what? They have their time, and this is their time right now. Christ said that to the Pharisees. Right? You make the long prayers, and you deceive the people, and, and hold all these commandments that I never really even commanded of you, that's good and all, but you know what? You have your reward. And he said that. They have their reward. But for us that are faithful, if we just trust Christ, maybe a little tough right now. Maybe some battles we lose along the way spiritually, but you know what? We've already won the war. Already won. I just spent this last week enjoying my Christmas gift of recapping and watching the Atlanta Braves win the World Series this year. Got the whole coverage of all the games, and game one, the World Series, great game. Six, seven, six, two, Braves win. Game two, not as exciting. Braves lost that battle. Games three and four, close games, but the Braves squeaked them out. Game five, they lost, but you know what? Game six, they won the war. 
They won the battle. You know what was neat about that? Before I put that first disc in, I already knew the result. And you know what? We already know the result. Before we, before we get into this book, before we open this Bible each day, you know what? There's going to be some battles we lose. You know, the Braves lost a few games in that series. They lost twice in the World Series before they won the World Series. So they lost some battles. But you know what? They won it all. They won the title. And you know what? As believers, we've already won. But where is God in our lives? Is he preeminent? And if he is, it's going to reflect in the way we give, not just of our money. You know, I'm not going after money here. I'm just saying of ourselves, of our time, of our talents, and yes, of our money. If God is first place, it will reflect in the way we live. All right, appreciate your attention. We'll stand together. We'll have a, a word of prayer tonight, and we'll be dismissed. I appreciate uh, your time and attention there, uh, looking at the book of Malachi. Overcoming apathy. It's a dangerous, it's a dangerous attitude to have. And the devil is the master of apathy, of just lulling us to sleep spiritually. When we remember who God is, keep him in his rightful place in our lives, and then just say, God, what would you have me to do with what you've blessed me with? My money, my time, myself, my talents. And just do what God would have you to do. And I keep thinking back as Brother, Brother Scott Hall, who's with the Lord now, talked about his ordination with Pastor Gwen, who's still here with us today. 86, I think, almost years old now. And he remembered the, what Brother Gwen said to him. It wasn't anything profound in the statement itself, but just the, the impact of that statement. Just mind the Lord. And may I remind us that? Just mind the Lord. Do what God would have you to do. I've been amazed just what God has done in our family and the path that he's leading us on now. Not something I imagined or envisioned 10 years ago, even th three, four years ago. But you know what? God had a plan. And I just had to say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'll follow you wherever you lead us. And it's been a wild ride, but it's been an enjoyable ride uh, following God's perfect plan. And that's hope that's the case for all of us. Will there be some difficulties? Will there be some potholes we may say on the path? Absolutely. Will there be some battles we lose? Yes. But we've won the war. Praise God for that. Let's pray and then we can be dismissed tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. And I uh, look forward to uh, having Pastor back here Sunday for our, uh, first, for our Sunday services this weekend. Lord, you know, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. Lord, we thank you for the truth of Scripture. Dealing with apathy, Lord. And Lord, if we're not careful, the devil can just lull us to sleep spiritually. We can become complacent and comfortable with the blessings you've given us. And Lord, there are certainly many blessings that we can thank you for right here at Bible Baptist Temple. Uh, Lord, it's just amazing. Lord, just how you bless this church that Pastor and Miss Kim can take 20 plus thousand dollars halfway across the country to give uh, to, to a bunch of young church planners that are just trying to follow your will for their lives and establishing gospel ministries and churches all across this country. Lord, that's a testament to the faithfulness and giving of, of your people right here tonight. And uh, Lord, we just trust in you by faith that you would take the, what, what we give and what this church has done and multiply it for your kingdom. And uh, Lord, we even look at Kenya and just look at what you've done uh, through Pastor and Kim's ministry, Lord, the churches that were established while they were there and now how those ministries have multiplied so many times over. Lord, we have no idea this side of eternity just the impact of what our giving can do. Uh, but Lord, it starts with our hearts. When we look to you and keep you first in our lives and know and realize that you are preeminent. You are before all things. And because of you, we're here today, Lord. The Bible says in Colossians 1, and by you, all things consist. Without you, Lord, we are nothing. We have nothing. And Lord, help us to keep you in that rightful place in our lives. And Lord, may it then affect what we say, what we do, may affect what we do with the talents, the blessings you give us, because Lord, everything we have is truly a stewardship from you. Help us, Lord, to take good care of what you've blessed us with. And help us just to obey you. And Lord, again, we're not just talking about money. We're talking about our, our lives and just our plans and our ambitions and our will. And may we yield to you, let you be first place in our lives and just do with our lives, do with our resources as you see fit. And Lord, we thank you for the blessing upon this church. And because of the faithfulness and giving your people, this church is where it is, I believe, today. Debt-free, uh, beautiful facilities, and uh, 80... 80 or so missionaries and, and mission projects uh, that the church is involved in. Just looking on the back board, Lord, that we're already going to reach this goal probably several weeks before missions conference. That's a, that's a, a wonderful testament to the faithfulness of, of your people right here that just following you by faith. That's why we call it faith promise missions. <clears throat> Lord, we don't know what you're going to do with 
with 150,000 plus uh, that this church has given or is committed to giving this year. But Lord, we know you're going to do something with it, and we just pray that your will will be done. Lord, God, direct us the remainder of this week. Help us be faithful with the health and the strength that you give us. Uh, we pray for Pastor Miss Kim, that you bring them back safely later this week from the conference, and just pray for a, a prosperous, fruitful time, relaxing time for them away. <clears throat> we do pray for many that are down and out with COVID or with other sicknesses, and those that have been mentioned on the prayer list tonight, that you would look upon those folks and, and uh, heal and strengthen and meet needs in great and mighty ways. And we pray and ask these things now. 